you know, I made the decision to go into the pub to get the drink, to pay for it and drink again, to drink again and drink and drink and drink. I made that choice. I made the choice to go to the kitchen to get a knife to attack the person because I didn't have a solution. It just didn't occur to me. I wish I had, but it didn't. The Bethlehem Royal in South London houses 120 mentally disordered offenders. So we're in effect really working with patients who are mentally sick and have been involved in serious crime. We're not talking about minor offending, but major acts of violence such as homicide, serious sexual violence, and patients are complicated further by having very complex emotional and mental health issues. John has been in secure institutions for 22 years. Growing up in Zimbabwe, he had corrective surgery for a rare birth defect. I mean, a lot of my friends just accepted me, but there was a, a, a minority who didn't. They made it clear that I was different, unusual, strange, and uh, that played on my confidence in my self-esteem, really, you know? And one of the ways that I thought I'd combat the feelings that that produced later on was to drink. And that, that just magnified some of those feelings that I already had. John has a personality disorder, and when he drinks, he can be unpredictably violent. This is the timeline. So these are historical events, significant events in my life that may have uh, had a, a psychological, emotional impact on me in some way. This, is, uh, this forms part of the violent reduction program. Um, so these are highs and lows. Um, so a low, for example, would be as a child being bullied, uh, some, um, some sexual abuse. And um, this is my index offence. It's the primary offence. I stabbed a man several times. I spent the night drinking with him. I was drinking out of a can in his lounge, and I, and I said, could I get a glass for, for, the, um, uh, for the beer? And he directed me to the kitchen. And when I went to the kitchen, I started opening up the cupboards, but I, I completely forgot why I was in the kitchen. And I saw a block of knives, and I came back out with a carving knife, and I, uh, and I attacked him. They can do a huge amount of therapy, understanding their offending history, their offense, their risk profile. But at some point, you've got to test it out with reality. You've got to be outside the hospital to see how you manage with community life, the stresses, the challenges of being in a big city like London. Today, John is facing those challenges. After decades inside, he has permission to go into the local community without a member of staff. It's really quite exhilarating. Being unaccompanied, being on my own, feels quite liberating. Everyone's fascinated by the concept of extreme violence, murder, mental illness. The sort of terminology that the news of the world always used was the stop phrase, scum of the earth. It's a very powerful statement, isn't it? Scum of the earth. Uh, they're, they're very conscious of that. Our patients obviously want to return back to the community in a safe and successful way. I suspect often the public would wish they stayed here, perhaps indefinitely. Most of them would see them as sick, dangerous and nasty individuals. We have to, in many ways, persuade them that what we're doing is safe, thought through and very responsible. I might experience anxiety, and I, and, I, and I do every day. But there are varying intensities and, and depths to that. 
most of the time it's just, you know, it's manageable. It's just, you know, it's okay. I'm okay. If I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, we're all right. Random things will happen. That's life. It just feels, it feels unmanageable. That's me, my mind, playing tricks on me. So I don't engage with that. I stick to my plan. What everyone else is doing, that's their plan. My plan is different. My plan is look after me, mate. One of his problems is that uh, when things don't go according to plan, or when others make mistakes, or when things are unpredictable, he gets very stressed, very anxious. And in the past, he has coped uh, by drinking alcohol, taking illicit uh, drugs. That would lead to a risk of violence to, to others. When I was a child and I did something wrong, I was very aware that I've done something wrong. But you have that sense of, I'm in trouble. And I've been, I've been in situations where I've had a sense of being in trouble or done something wrong or panic, that I have to phone somebody. And uh, invariably what I do is I phone the police. John phoned the police in 1998 after he stabbed a man he'd been drinking with. He was found guilty of attempted murder. At the time when the police officer arrested me, asked me how many times did I stab, and I, in my mind it was once. My mind had completely censored the whole event, and that it seemed like it was only once, but in actual fact it was several, it was 13 times. This is what I have to cope with. It's a drama. Why is it a drama? Oh, look at his boots, you know what I mean? That would just, that's just... They've got mud all over them, mate, from yesterday. I can't wear those. John's been living under lock and key for 22 years. I can't wear those, mate, you know. Now, he's been judged safe enough to take daily trips into the local community without an escort. I mean, we all struggle in this. Oh, I struggle. I have, uh, you know, everyone has difficulties, don't we? We've all got difficulties. You know what I mean? Because I, I do have like this image thing, uh, difficulty with myself, and um, oh, I would, is it problematic? It has been, you know, self-esteem, confidence, the, you know, where I perceive myself, you know, like in, in the 90s when a guy with a camera filming me in my face, all our image, you know, this was on my birthday, and you know, and I, and I reacted quite aggressively to that. I threatened him with a knife and went to the kitchen. Just because he was filming you? Not because he was filming me, it was the reaction that the other people had. As if like, oh, look at you, you've definitely got a funny face, look at your head's like, well, you know what I mean? Identifying faults, that's what I felt. I felt like you were identifying faults, you were looking at, you know? Uh, I had problems with, because I've got no knuckles. Do you know what I mean? So I can't bend them. So if I punch somebody, I, I, you know, that, that finger's been broken. So I've used a weapon as an extension of this, or, um, as an extension of my, my, my rage. So I might have seen a knife as like an injecting, injecting all my fear into, into somebody else, you know? A few days after threatening the man with the camera, John committed the stabbing that gave him a life sentence. Five years before that, he used a knife on his girlfriend in a violent, unprovoked attack. It was a similar pattern. I feel trapped and I feel, I do feel a need to kind of try and protect myself because I wrongly perceived a danger, a threat. I attacked her and I had, I had stabbed her and I phoned the police and the ambulance and I was arrested and I spent, uh, was sentenced to prison for six years. What did you feel about what had happened? I felt appalled. I felt appalled and disgusted in myself. Sometimes our patients are involved with are very serious, they're, they're very tragic, they're often extreme. 22, 22. Because of the graveness of their crimes, they won't achieve this thing called atonement, which is almost a sense of self-forgiveness. 
our job as a team is to somehow help them bear the enormity of what they've done. And that's a really compelling, but also a very complicated piece of work. I think it's about this process, you know, it's something meaningful and real has to happen, you know, that there has to be like a genuine change. There has to be some understanding about, you know, these, these events, however difficult they are and painful they are, is to understand these, why these things happen. This is why I'm in a hospital and this is why I'm trying to, you know, make amends in some way. As the prospect of being discharged from the Bethlehem Royal becomes real, John has started to look for voluntary work. Subject, volunteering. Dear sir, madam, I'm currently an inpatient with the Bethlehem Royal Hospital. I'm cur I currently have extensive community leave that I'm currently looking, I currently, currently. I'd be grateful if you could let me know of any positions you have. Paragraph, paragraph, yours sincerely, send. Beautiful. Who's that? That's, that's me as a kid. Uh, I reckon I'm 13. <laughs> with my bowl cut, <laughs> but just I think it's, it's uh, I think it's sad because of like uh, you know this kid, uh, he's not he's not smoking, he's not drinking. Oh. Good to see you around. How are you doing? And where has life taken you? <sighs> see, how do you answer that? Where where do you even begin with that? Where do you even start? Hi, mate. I don't even know where to start. I've been in the hospital recently, mate. I had a few psych problems. That's for the last 35 years. <laughs> An email, letter or two. <laughs> uh, how do you explain 35 years? Doctors are about caring and I take pride in the fact that I'm working with a group of patients who are probably the most dispossessed, sidelined, rejected in society. Shame and isolation for patients increases their risk. If we tackle that effectively, compassionately, we reduce the risk significantly.